everyone, I'm Father Bo. I am a Ukrainian Catholic priest here in Edmonton. Uh, we actually happen to be in my parish, Dormition of the Mother of God. Uh, nice little parish on the West End. My name is Father Chris Schmidt, and I'm pastor of Arlie of the Angels Catholic Parish and surrounding parishes out in Fort Saskatchewan and area. I'm originally from St. Albert, and I've been a priest for six years for the Archdiocese of Edmonton. The word Catholic means universal. It's the, the faith of the whole church. Uh, it's the faith of the whole world. When God established the church, he established it for everyone. So it's the name of the entire church. Mm -hmm. I think one thing to kind of keep in mind, it's not as evident for us today because all religions are kind of spread throughout the world, but definitely in that period of history, religions were very tied to the culture of the place. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of a religion being for all peoples was extremely novel in the time of Jesus. Well, there are lots of parishes. Of course, every city has multiple parishes typically and such. But if you think of church as a group of churches that are organized together and, and have a certain type of structure, there's actually 23 different Catholic churches. For example, Roman Catholic is by far the biggest of all the Catholic churches. Um, but Ukrainian Catholic, which I happen to be one of, is the second biggest. But there's 23 different expressions of the Catholic faith. So it kind of follows Peter, really. Um, so from Jesus and his apostles and the apostles being sent out and Peter eventually facing his martyrdom in Rome um, and that becoming the, the see of Peter. And so kind of when the church started to, to grow and to blossom, the, the question was, well, well where, does, where do we look to for guidance and direction in the way that we live out our faith? And so as Roman Catholics, it was always focused as Peter as the primary one among the apostles. Um, so among all the 12 apostles, equally given that same commission that Jesus gave, but seeing Peter as standing apart or slightly above the rest as um, you know, the primate of the whole church. And because of his martyrdom in Rome and then with um, the Edict of Milan when Christianity became uh, public and no longer hidden because of fear of persecution, that became the place because of the Roman Empire that allowed that faith to spread um, all through, through Europe and the Roman Empire at that time. Well, we too start with the apostles. Peter, before he got to Rome, uh, spent most of his time in the Middle East and in what we now known as, know as Greece and Turkey and such. So that Greek culture also has a claim to the apostles. Uh, they were present, they set up the church. It had a different expression than the Latin side of the world. It had the Greek expression, but the church was there right from the get-go for, for both churches. The Ukrainian Catholic Church in particular, um, as the church spread outward, uh, the Slavic people to the north, which includes what is now known as Ukraine, um, became baptized and, and became a Christian country. And so the church developed and grew from there. So officially, we came into union with the Roman Catholic Church in the 1600s, uh, but really the, the Christian faith in all cases is, comes right from Christ. So what, what ties us together as Catholics is the leadership of the Pope, today Pope Francis. And so he becomes the, the primary among all the bishops in the world. Um, in kind of leading the church, kind of the protection of that chair of Peter, of that role of Peter in and amongst all of the successor of the apostles, which are the bishops. Then within the different churches or the different rites, everyone has their own archbishop, bishop, patriarch, different titles, but generally basically the same role of being successors of the apostles. So in the West, in the Roman Catholic Church, we talk about um, bishops, and then in the East, it's more patriarchs. 
kind of correct me. Yeah, no, we uh, we all have the same pope. I brought some pictures from the walls of our church. So we all share one leader of the entire church, well, which is Christ. But his his person on earth, of course, is the pope who leads the entire Catholic Church. And then if we kind of want to think of it as a, a step down a level, each particular church, so the Roman Catholic Church has a leader of the Roman Catholic Church, and then the Ukrainian Catholic Church and every other church has a leader of their particular church. Um, some of the smaller ones might kind of skip a level or two, but after we have the Pope is the leader of your particular church. So in your case, it would be the same guy. So you get to hold the picture twice uh, because the Pope, uh, the Patriarch of Rome, how he used to be called, even though he dropped that title lately, uh, he'd be the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. But the leader of the Ukrainian Catholic Church happens to be our Patriarch, and his name is Sviatoslav. So when it comes to on the church's level, the patriarch of the church leads the entire church. And then, well, you get into archbishops and bishops. So in your case here in Edmonton, you're from an archdiocese. So your archbishop happens to be... Archbishop Richard Smith. Yes, sorry, Archbishop Richard, your frame is smaller. Uh, it's because you weren't hanging on the wall of my church. Uh, so you have an archbishop who is kind of the, the bishop of his local territory, but he also takes care of uh, overseeing a group of dioceses together, correct? And that would be all of Alberta for the uh, most part? Not quite. But not quite? Cool. Okay, so something like that. Well, and I have a, a metropolitan. It's the same thing as an archbishop. In fact, his full title is Metropolitan Archbishop. And he is the the Metropolitan or the Archbishop of all of Canada for us. So he is the Archbishop. There's five different bishops across Canada, and he is kind of like the CEO, the, the top of that group of, uh, of bishops. And uh, then we go down a level to your local bishop, and who happens to be your local bishop? Archbishop Richard Smith. Yeah, so you have the same guy who is your local bishop and your, your Archbishop, uh, whereas, my Metropolitan Lawrence, he lives in Winnipeg, and my local bishop is Bishop David, who is a lovely man, uh, really fair, really good, kind of short, but we love him totally and completely. And yes, I bug him about his height all the time, but he loves me anyway. Um, so that's kind of the, the structure of who are all of our hierarchs. So we have the same structure, in case of Edmonton, you guys mentioned two people in your prayers, probably, because you only have two people to mention. Right. In our case, we typically mention four because, well, we have four. Here's where us Roman Catholics are less good <laughs> than the Ukrainian Catholics, is the Ukrainian Catholics are generally more familiar with the Roman liturgy than Ca Roman Catholics are with the Ukrainian liturgy. Um, so I'll hand it off to Father Bo. Sure, well, you're welcome to come and join me anytime. Of course, as Catholics, we can join each other at the altar and co-celebrate anytime. Um, the structure is basically the same. Um, there is the first part of the service where we focus on the liturgy of the word, and then the second part of the service where we focus on the liturgy of the Eucharist. So both are similar. Uh, they have certainly evolved in different cultures, so the cultures and the history of those cultures have affected things in various ways. Um, in a lot of people try and compare length of the service and such. That's actually pretty similar. We tend to sing everything. Uh, in your church, often it's sung, but it's often recited too. Now with COVID, we're kind of forced to recite things, but... Um, the services in general are the exact same. Uh, there's morning prayers, there's evening prayers, there's prayers of the hours throughout the day. The types of services and what we do during them is the same, and the goal of them is the same, but how we celebrate them is a little bit different. Um, in the East, our services haven't changed much in the last 1,500 years, whereas as late as the 1960s at Vatican II, uh, at least one of the traditions of your liturgical, one of the liturgical rites has changed a bunch. Yeah. So in essence, the two services are the same. 
uh, in spirit, the two services are the same, but in execution, oh, it's, it's a lovely difference, and both are profound and beautiful, and both have their, their special points, which I love visiting the Roman Catholic Church and praying with them, and most people who have come to a Ukrainian Catholic Church from a Roman Catholic point of view go, wow, that's different, and, and we tend to complement each other in lots of different ways. I would say... So I've had the, the blessing of being at Divine Liturgy a few times as a seminarian, never had a chance to get as a, as a priest to can celebrate it at any Divine Liturgy, but uh, my opinion is that uh, the Ukrainian Catholics have done a much better job at kind of maintaining your tradition within the liturgy. Hmm. And as Roman Catholics, we've, at least um, in North America, we've lost a lot of our tradition. So one of those, the big parts of that is chant at the Mass. Hmm. So you've preserved that, and in most places, uh, most parishes, we've almost entirely lost the tradition of chant at the Mass. We're trying to reclaim it a little bit now, um, but we have, he was actually a Ukrainian Catholic seminarian who was a friend of mine that reminded me that we have just as many mm -hmm. modes of chanting the Mass as you do in the Ukrainian rite, yep. and we sometimes know one <laughs> of those traditional modes. Well, and, and that varies between place to place. Yeah. Just like in our church, there are some parishes who sing the same song every single Sunday, and we have other parishes that are musically talented and, and do lots. So too with the Roman Catholic Church. Like Gregorian chant is, is huge and beautiful, and you do have lots of melodies and lots of ability to do that. Some places in the world have preserved that very strongly, and others have, un well, I don't want to say de-emphasized it, but uh, emphasized it less. Um, so there is that beauty in your tradition as well, sure. especially when you get into, uh, well, the different liturgical rites within our own churches. There are more than one type of liturgy or mass. One of the kind of principles behind the approach to Roman liturgy is kind of uh, beauty and simplicity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the practical ways that that plays out is as Roman Catholics, we say, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, just the three times. And <laughs> Ukrainians love to repeat it many times. Uh, someone told me that we're a little bit thicker, so we need to say it more times <laughs> to get it through our skulls. Um, well, part of why we tend to repeat things is because it's like a public oath. Right. And the history of our church, it grew up in a place where it had lots of different challenges. Of course, there was the, the Hebrew Jewish culture, there was the Arabic, uh, sorry, the Islamic culture, there was farther Eastern ones, there was the Western cultures. And in order to survive, in order to maintain our strength, we had to profess our faith and teach our faith more often. Mm. So by saying things three times, it was like publicly professing, this is what I mean, this is really what I mean, this is what I mean. And we often, in our liturgies, we also repeat creeds and, and statements of faith, saying we believe in one God. And, and that's kind of a way of dealing with the world around us, because many of the people around us accused us of having multiple gods, but the reality is, is we have one God who has three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, which is something we totally share in common. All Christianity believes that there is one God, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Well, if I may just ask you, what would you say is a typical or maybe a proper response from a Roman Catholic when I say, what is the purpose of life? What's the goal of life? Uh, <laughs> Just a small of life. To, to love, honor, and serve God in this life so as to be with him in the next. Yeah. I think that's the Baltimore Catechism answer to that question. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, for us, similarly and complementary, ours is to unite ourselves with God. Uh, it's, it's an interesting little difference, and again, this is historical stuff. Uh, in the West, one of the big things that influenced you guys a little bit more is, well, the Black Plague. It wasn't quite coronavirus, I don't think, but um, a lot of people died. And so the theology in the West tended towards 
what's coming up, what's next, what's in the, the next life. So your answer as you gave it is so that we can continue to be with him in the next life. Right? Um, and that's perfectly valid and good. It's a, it's a lovely perspective. Um, Black Plague for the East was you know, a bad case of the sniffles. Uh, most people were immune to it to some degree anyway, so um, because it came from there probably. Um, so our theology was much more based on uniting ourselves and, and becoming one with Christ, being in communion. So we call this theosis or becoming one with God or deification is another word that we use for it. So there is spiritual emphasis differences, but what we do is the same. Uh, we just look at the same coin from two different perspectives. So you might say, oh, it's a heads, and I'll say, oh, it's tails, but we can both agree that the coin is the same quarter. And is part of that as well, you know, in my experience, the East does a better job at emphasizing the role of the Holy Spirit hmm. in, in the Trinity. Uh, maybe certain no. persons from the okay. East. I think there's a lot of Western scholars and Western fathers and mothers who also emphasize that. Um, I, both churches certainly value their equality, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal and undivided in any kind of way. So I wouldn't say that we emphasize it more. Um, but yeah, you might hear in the prayers, you know, we mention the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. And that's, again, to kind of explain things over and over again to try and strengthen the faith of the people. And then with our Blessed Mother, mm -hmm. um, not really a difference, just kind of a difference in, like, for in the East, the Theotokos is, mm -hmm. is the way that you express that devotion to Mary. Because it's an yeah. Eastern word. The word Theotokos comes from the Greek culture, which is part of where most of the Catholic churches, most of the Christian churches of the East comes from. Although there are also churches based in Africa, out of Alexandria and the Middle East and other places as well, even as far as India. Um, but Theotokos literally means the God-bearer, the mother of God. Right. So it's just a, a title that we give to her. Um, yeah, we all recognize her role as completely human, but one who cooperated willingly with God's plan and, and therefore brought about God into the world. I don't know. I have to probably think about it, but I think in, for us, what you would hear most often is the primary title is Mary Ever Virgin. Yes. Um, in the, the West, but when you go and pray the Hail Mary, both of those titles are, are included in the, in the Hail Mary. So. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's, yeah, it's a lovely prayer and 98% of it comes right from scripture. Yep. yep. Yes, <laughs> plain and simple. So let me just take this to the bigger picture. A sacrament is something that we do here on earth that we recognize that God participates in it as well. So, for example, when we baptize someone, uh, either we pour water or we immerse them into water. So we are kind of doing some symbolic actions, but we also recognize that God participates in that service and actually recreates us in, in a little bit of a way. He, he brings us further into who we really are in the first place. Um, so both churches recognize that there are seven sacraments that are known, professed, and, and, and there. Um, but the Ukrainian Catholic Church would lean towards there are at least seven. So we'd say these are the seven biggies, but everything that we do in life is meant to be sacramental. So even things like um, a monk or a nun doing their consecration, their, um, their tonsure, we would say, well, that's kind of a sacrament although we wouldn't count it as one of the big seven, or a funeral service. We'd say, oh yeah, that's kind of a sacrament, even though we wouldn't count it among the, the big seven. Yeah. I, to me, that's pretty high up on the list of kind of the Catholic thing, the beauty of Catholicism, is that our whole existence is sacramental, insofar as God willingly chooses to work in and through created things to make himself known mm -hmm. um, and to me that's hard to deal with like how does God 
actually reveal his grace through broken creation, because he does, but that's one of the big hurdles of um, Catholic spirituality is coming to, to recognize how that's possible. Um, but to me, it's much more appealing than just kind of separating physical from spiritual, where certain Christians will have, okay, well, I have my physical life, and then I go to God and trying to receive those spiritual graces apart. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is the reason why our churches are built the way that they are, because they express God to us. We don't whitewash our walls and say that we come here for simply a spiritual experience, but we say that through the created beauty, we come to see the face of God. Yeah. Like, we do have a mind, a body, and a soul, but we're only one person. We, uh, we can't split those apart. So yes, certainly the world is part of who we are and, and where we find God. I think that's kind of, just to jump in on one of the questions that I remember, is the difference between our churches mm -hmm. is because they, they grew up out of the people of the place, mm -hmm. right? From the sacramental life of the people of the place. And so the, the culture and the tradition of the people expressed itself through the liturgical art that they created. And so Rome was very different than the Middle East, very different from the Slavic people. And you can even see within the West um, differences within the West because mm -hmm. as Christianity spreads and as time goes on, there's a difference in expression because different traditions um, pop up. Yeah, absolutely. You guys are so organized. <laughs> we might be emotional and write lots of poetry, but boy, are you guys organized. <laughs> we can marry other people, but we can't get married. Uh, I've married lots of people, but to each other. Um, the answer is, is no. Uh, once you become a priest, you may not marry. The, what I think you're getting at is, for example, I am a married priest. I have my wedding ring right here. Uh, I was married before coming a priest. So this used to be fairly common in the entire church in the first millennium almost. Uh, certainly the first 500 se uh, centuries, it was common for priests to be married. Mm -hmm. And then later on in history, um, the Roman Catholic Church basically made it the norm within itself, not a faith issue, but a practical issue for celibacy. So go ahead. Yeah, so it kind of grew, celibate priesthood was always also a part mm -hmm. of the church. They kind of lived side by side, married mm -hmm. clergy and celibate clergy. And scripturally where you kind of anchor that is in Peter who was married and Paul who was not. Mm -hmm. And that kind of becomes the, the icon of those two expressions of the priesthood. Uh, in the West, because of a lot of different historical factors, uh, the church acknowledged and recognized the value and the merit of celibate priesthood and to prevent a lot of issues that were happening in the time, which one of the big ones was priesthood being passed on and the property and money that went with that passed on from generation to generation, was, which was completely missing the idea of what a priest was. Um, adopting celibacy as part of the prerequisites for priesthood um, became part of the, the teaching and the practice of the church. So what we always like to distinguish is that male priesthood is divinely instituted. Celibate priesthood is a law of the church for the sake of fostering that divinely instituted male priesthood by Christ. So, technically speaking, could celibate priesthood be reversed in the West? Yes, because the church has the ability to change that. It was she's the one who, through the Holy Spirit, deemed it fit for the time. Is it likely? No. Because one of the things that's still shared between East and West is that the fullness of the priesthood, which we find in the bishop as the successor of the apostles, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but in the East is always celibate. Yep. So in, in the East, we also have both celibate and married clergy. Again, you don't get married after you become a priest, but uh, both exist and we recognize that it's normal to have people in both ways. Some people are called to be married, some people aren't. 
Um, and both can be beautiful and good. Uh, certainly bishops are selected from among those who aren't married. Now there's slight exception to someone who's been widowed. Uh, so there are husband, uh, sorry, priests who have lost their wife who then could become a bishop. Um, and there's a couple other kind of canonical, technical ways that it could happen. But in general, all bishops, uh, they are the ones who deal with the, the properties and stuff like that. The, the clergy, I don't own this church. This is administrated by the bishop. So if I was to have children, which I do, you know, none of this church goes to my kids because it's, it's not mine. This is, this is the bishop's. And so as the bishop, he, he oversees and takes care of the entire church. And so to avoid those same kind of you know, inheritance issues, uh, bishops are also selected from celibate people. One of the things people sometimes bring up is, well, I know a Roman Catholic priest that is married, so mm -hmm. how is that possible? Um, most of the time, the, the reason for that is uh, conversion. And so the ones that I'm can think of off the top of my head, so within our own province, um, previously a Lutheran bishop that converted to Roman Catholicism and was an ordained a Catholic priest. And so the church didn't say, you have to leave your life for the sake of being a priest. Um, a big um, group that did that almost collectively was when Pope Benedict allowed for the Anglican ordinariate in the Catholic church. So all of these Anglican priests who were married and had families who came into union with Rome, wanted to acknowledge their priesthood, but needed to be ordained, validly ordained, and so they were validly ordained and kept their wives and continued to, to practice the priesthood. Yep, there's advantages and disadvantages in both types of ways. Uh, certainly with a family and such, when my bishop says, you gotta move from here to there, that makes it really difficult for me to do that. Or, you know, if someone calls in the middle of my child's birthday and says, you need to go to the hospital now, you know, it's really hard to do that as a married guy. Whereas a celibate person, it's never easy to just pick up and go, but it's a little bit easier because you don't always have those family ties. On the other hand, I might have experiences, you know, with marriage issues and stuff like that, which you perhaps don't have those experiences. Nor does it mean because I'm married, I'm better at marriage stuff because I know a lot of married people who are lousy at marriage stuff and a lot of single people who treat people with dignity and respect. So both have their advantages and disadvantages and both are beautiful ways of, of loving God. Uh, marriage is a sacrament and celibacy is, is certainly a choice. I would call it a sacrament, toll if not a sacrament, uh, a choice in life that can bring us further and deeper into the life of God. Uh, so I guess, start with, it is the same Lord who is present mm -hmm. in the sacred species that every Catholic is receiving, so that doesn't change. Um, the, the matter and the, the practice of receiving differ slightly, um, but the substance is the same, which is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, generally what is used are kind of the wafers, or the hosts that we use, which are kind of almost like a dried um, piece of bread um, for that, and then the wine, the sacramental wine that we use for the precious blood, and they're, they're distributed separately. So the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ in the chalice for the blood of Christ and the, the Eucharistic minister in the ciborium for the body of Christ. During COVID, no blood of Christ for anybody um, because of shared chalices. So we can't give um, the Blessed Sacrament under the species of the blood during this period. So there's kind of a separation there. Uh, and then for receiving in the West, generally there is um, the option based on the devotion of the individual to either receive reverently always in the hand and then to consume or to receive directly on the tongue when people come forward and then again within posture of coming forward people will go differently there's no requirement to kneel anymore um, 
70 years ago, there would have been. People would have come up to the altar rail and kneeled to receive solely on the tongue. But now some people choose to kneel, some people stand, and both are acceptable. Yep. In the East, we typically use leavened bread, um, bread that's risen. You know, we remember that Christ is risen, and although pa the Passover meal has its place, it's also the fulfillment of that. So we use leavened bread. So oftentimes at home, you'll find me baking bread. Uh, it's a very simple bread and kind of a special bread that we pray as we, we do it. And we also use grape wine, just like you do. Um, in our church, typically, we distribute them commingled. So there's a few different ways that it's done. Uh, in the Ukrainian Catholic Church, normally it's done by the priest mixes everything or commingles things in the chalice, and then we'll distribute the Eucharist by using a spoon. In the case of COVID, we're using single-use spoons, so everyone can feel confident and safe as, as much as possible. Of course, God will never get any of us sick, but you have to worry about those priests. Um, so we distribute the Eucharist together via spoon, but there's also different ways. We can do an intinction, which is basically where you take the, the body of Christ and you dip it into the blood of Christ and then distribute it to the people that way. There's lots of ways of distributing, but typically uh, it's leavened and it's distributed to the people by the priest um, during the liturgy. Very similar, same theology, same God, same same everything, and yet done a little bit differently. And just so that anyone who's watching, if they're curious, you can receive Eucharist in any tradition within the Catholic Church, um, so long as you are along with the faith, that you are a baptized member who is in good, good faith and, and ready to receive the Eucharist. So you can go to a Roman Catholic Church or a Ukrainian Catholic Church, and if you uh, show up to either one and you're not exactly sure what to do, just elbow the person next to you and say, hi, I'm Catholic, but I'm new here. How do I do this? And I'm sure that people will be kind enough to explain how to receive the Eucharist. Because we are. <laughs> well, we grew up in different parts of the world and therefore we had different influences and different histories. Um, in your house, if you went to Disneyland, maybe you would hang up pictures of your family wearing Mickey Mouse ears or whatever the case might be, and your house would be different than your neighbor's house who never went to Disneyland. As history and theology and spirituality evolved in different parts of the world, we had different ways of expressing it, and therefore our liturgical spaces uh, evolved to express our particular spirituality. Um, certainly the Roman Catholic Church has its beauty and its style, and we have our beauty and our style. Um, things that influenced us, for example, are we always make our icons, which you can see all around us and behind us, um, two-dimensionally. So we don't have any statues in our church for the most part. Of course, there's always a few exceptions to every rule, but statues would be something that you can walk around and, and know the whole of, which in our tradition is kind of something you can never know the whole of God. Um, so that's something that evolved and, and our artistic language of iconography became kind of canonized. It became, well, it had its own rule. That's what canons means. Uh, so it's a particular language of art. Whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, you have many different expressions of religious art, mm -hmm. including statues. Yeah, and again, a lot of those came from, from the, the place. So, you know, like the idea of a basilica comes very much from Roman architecture. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of, we'll sometimes talk about baptizing things of the culture. And so we take what we see as good and ultimately divinely inspired if it is good, then it comes from God, and then we transform it into what we need its purpose to be. So where that roots itself in is the cross was an element of torture, but because of Christ, that becomes a sign of hope, of eternal life. And so big Roman basilicas transformed into these beautiful churches and places of worship instead of these public spaces for Roman politics. And then 
through the, the centuries, different influences on architecture, on art, whether that's through mosaics, whether that's through painting, through sculpture, all of these things come into the culture of the people and through their faith, express their faith through these means that are developed through human abilities. Yeah. And our liturgical services certainly influence things too. Uh, our vestments tend to be different. They they're both have their ancient roots, but different people in different parts of the world wore different clothes and had different symbols. Uh, the way we stand at the altar, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church, for the most part, you stand facing the people at what I would call the back of the altar. And I, as a Ukrainian Catholic, normally stand facing God with the people at the front of the altar. And it's a difference between, again, images of how we're proceeding. Uh, in your tradition, it's certainly we're all standing at the same table and Christ is there on, on the altar being, being offered. Uh, of course, we participate in the one offering of Christ himself. Um, so you all stand around a table. In our church, we have the, uh, the kind of the vision of all of us are traveling in the same direction and the priest is part of the people. So we're all kind of moving forward and I'm not trying to walk backwards and hopefully I don't trip over anything, but I, I face Christ as I lead the people towards him. So both are complementary and beautiful, uh, but they're different. Say if, if we can't hold that together, then neither could we hope in marriages existing. Because marriage is two uniquely different people coming together, seeking for union in that relationship. And so if we can't say that two churches that are uniquely different can't live in unity, then we're saying marriage is not possible either. What you remember and you focus on is what unites to start with. That's your starting point. You don't focus first on what's different because otherwise you'd never get to any point of unity. So our faith is very much the same. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ who is the incarnate Son of God who through his suffering, death, and resurrection brought eternal life to the world and by the gift of the Holy Spirit leads and guides and directs his church back to the Father. That is uniting all Catholics throughout the world then as you grow from there, then as we've kind of talked about in other ways, it expresses itself differently in the world. And so then you start to try to understand first, well, why is it different? And so we've talked a little bit, and I've grown an understanding today and kind of why expressions have been different. And then you can see how difference doesn't need to divide. Mm -hmm. And what I always go back to when I talk to people about this just in general is, at the heart of our faith is one God in three distinct persons. And so within the heart of our faith is unity among difference. And so in order for us to really know God and be united to God is to strive to live that here and now of unity and difference. And I think it was St. John Paul II who talked about we need to learn how to breathe with both lungs kind of became a famous saying with the East and the West of the church, that we're part of the same body of Christ and we both contribute to that living body of Christ in the world. Well said. All right. <laughs> yeah, just as the apostles were diverse and yet they were one church, so too the rest of the followers of, of Christ are diverse as well. And the unity and diversity is a good thing. Uh, to, to just add my two cents, because I always do, and you can edit this out if you want to. Uh, I have an aquarium at home. If I have no top feeding fish, all the food that floats in the top, that's beautiful and good and offered for food, uh, it eventually stagnates and, and causes a scum on the top of the tank, and, and therefore the whole fish tank is poisoned because there's nothing eating at the top of, of the fish tank. And similarly, the food that falls at the bottom, if you only have top feeders, then the food that hits the bottom won't get eaten and will turn scummy and poison the whole tank. So you need diversity in order to have a healthy fish tank. You need the diversity to have a healthy church. 
we just have to figure out who's the scum suckers. <laughs> uh, but we're all, we're all beautiful creations of God who are allowed to have our, our differences and yet still have our unity. Unity and diversity, not in uniformity. Yeah. And I think that's part of the, the Catholic ethos that has allowed Catholicism to reach every corner of the world. Mm -hmm. Because in my pretty limited experience with, with other cultures, primarily with First Nations people of Canada, is that the Catholic expression of the Christian faith allows for that difference and doesn't demand uniformity for the sake of the faith. That Christ expresses himself through the individual culture and doesn't impose himself on top of it. And so that very kind of heart of our Catholic faith is what unites us and what allows us to bring Christ to all different peoples throughout the world. Amen. Frequently. <laughs> uh, we all are part of the same team, if you want to think of it that way. We're brothers and sisters. We should work with each other all the time. The more we know and learn about each other, the more rich our understanding of our own faith will be. Um, but in what ways can we work without working together? Yeah. Um, we're here for bringing the kingdom of God, uh, for participating in God's plan. How do, you, how do you work for a boss in common without being part of the same team? Yeah, I mean, there's, what differentiates us is, I don't want to kind of brush it off, but it, it's, so much more external than it is at the heart of who we are as Christians. And so there's really little to nothing that gets in the way for us doing anything together. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Father Bo, with we even priests from both rites can, can, can celebrate together. Like even liturgy is not something that we are distinctly a part in. Um, that what is different in us doesn't prevent in any way like it might with other Christian denominations where the expressions of their faith could sometimes impede uh, how we're able to work as Christians in the world. There can be real theological differences at the core. We don't have those. Our theology, our understanding of Christ and of the way that he works in the world through the church, through the sacraments, um, is the same. And so it's very easy for us to work side by side as Christians. Absolutely. And it's important for us while working together to still stay ourselves. Yes. Uh, it's important for Easterners to have an Eastern spirituality and Westerners to have a Western because if we kind of mix everything and just become one, one mixed stuff, then we, we lose that beauty and that diversity. It, it's nice to have all sorts of different things. If we were all the same, we'd be boring. Yep. I mean, can't deny that in our history, there have been moments of, of tension because of that difference, even within our own province, mm -hmm. between Ukrainian Catholics, Roman Catholics. Again, my opinion is that most often comes when we're letting the purely cultural or political thrust get in the way of the faith that unites us. And so within our own province and those tensions between the two, it's often when we focus on the cultural difference or the political difference in the life of the church to motivate what we do that heightens the difference and the tension. But when we come back to our union in Christ and of who we really are as Christians, those things quickly fade away. Yeah, if we keep our eyes on Christ, the rest falls into place. Yeah, amen. <laughs>